Today is such a joyous celebration of resurrection. And it's not like our community wasn't fabulous already, but there is an infusion of new energy and new joy and new love. Is there not in this room and everywhere present? Yeah. And it's thanks to all of you, to all of us, to this whole community that is attracting in new and glorious ways. And certainly that was a, a wonderful way to, if you were here between services, to see the, the joy on the lawn that just happened uh, with the Easter Bunny and the egg hunt and the bouncy house and so on. So it's that childlike joy that is a part of what is here for us today. There's also that deeper message of Easter that's here for us today. You know, um, it's, it's always interesting because we jump from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, and so much happens in this week in like the historical and the spiritual, and it's sort of like the leap over it, and we show up in our Easter bonnets, and it's like, oh, we did it! And it's like, oh, but we didn't really go through it. <laughs> so I want to back us up a little bit and bring us a little bit through it. What, what brings us to the resurrection? What allows us to get to this place? What is the threshold that we walk through? What happens? So, and in honor of that two-year anniversary, I want to tell you a joke that I'm pretty, pretty sure I told you on my first Sunday as well. So bear with me. I'll try to twist it a little bit, give it a little freshness. So it's a long time. Maybe you don't remember. Uh, <laughs> I don't remember what I had for breakfast yesterday, so I'm counting on that. Uh, <laughs> So, um, so there's the it's, pastor is new, and she brings in the children for a children's sermon, and all the, the congregation is sitting around. So she's pretty nervous, and so she asks the kids, can somebody tell me about Easter? And one of the kids shoots up his hand, and he says, oh, yeah, that's when the wise men come, and they bring presents to the baby Jesus. And she says, that's great. That's, that's a great description of Christmas. Now, could somebody tell me about Easter? And uh, the second kid, you know, shoots up her hand, and she says, that's when we give each other valentines and lots of love. And she says, that's a great description of Valentine's Day. Can anybody tell me about Easter? Now she's getting a little squirmy, you know, a little nervous that this isn't going to go where she wants it to go. And finally, the third child gets up very dramatically, you know, and says, on Easter Sunday, the stone is rolled from the tomb. And Jesus steps out into the light. Now the pastor is so excited she can hardly contain herself. And she says, then what happens? And the child says, Jesus looks around and he doesn't see a shadow. <laughs> and so it's spring. <laughs> That child was so clever because the truth is Jesus doesn't see a shadow. And do you know why? Because it's not there anymore. I mean, that's the joy of Easter, right? We annihilate, if you will, the shadow, the darker parts of us, the heavier parts, and we move into the fullness of the light. That's what's so joyful. But how do we get there? What's happened along the way? There's a lot to it. You know, the beauty of, of this particular path following this particular teacher, Jesus, and I know in unity, and for those of you who are new, I want to make sure you understand that we are very open and encouraging of all paths to the one. And yet our foundation is, is following the teachings that Jesus laid out for us. And, and this um, teaching of the resurrection is a very unique mystical teaching. It's very different than what maybe we think of as sort of a resurrection or an enlightenment kind of experience or an awakening kind of experience. Because often the way that we talk about that, or maybe what we're used to in, say, Eastern teachings, which are kind of, you know, our founders really studied Eastern teachings, so some of that is woven into unity. But this part is distinct. This, this resurrection idea is distinct. And so What's different is that those Eastern teachings or those other teachings um, that you might be exposed to are about kind of transcending our physical experience and moving into sort of the etheric spirit, right? To be, to transcend this world, to transcend the flesh, to get, get over it in a sense so that we can get on with it and get to, to home, to spirit, to, to the, the purity of that idea. 
And so, and, for, and, and in those tip teachings, often it's about the whole idea is to get off the karmic wheel, right? So you don't have to be reincarnated again. You've, you've come so far that you don't have to come to, to the earthy experience again. And Jesus' teaching is quite the opposite. See, the resurrection is that you become embodied in the, in the body again. I mean, what happens in the story is he, he comes back in the body, and he eats, and he walks with his friends, and he talks with his friends. So the whole idea of the resurrection is that it's here and it's now. And that by us saying yes to being incarnated at this time on our planet, and that by us saying yes to being on this spiritual journey, we're more than halfway there to that experience of pure light and pure love while we're in the body of the everlasting life and the being the, that gateway to life, all the I am's that Terry so beautifully shared with us today. I'm having trouble keep locating Terry. There she is. <laughs> and, and so it's that, it's that I am the life. I am the resurrection. I am the vine. I am the good shepherd. That great I am that we've been referring to all through this resurrecting the cosmic Christ series. It's like we come to that, but we don't come to that like in a levitated state necessarily. We come to it right here, right now, like this, looking like this. I mean, that's really the good news. Although for some of us, it's like, oh, darn, really? <laughs> right? Because it's not necessarily the easy path. It's not always the easy path. And that's, Jesus reminds us of that again and again. When I, um, I used to go to see this healer when I lived in Kansas City, and it was kind of a drive. She was out past Topeka, Kansas in the country. Her name was Laura. We shared a birthday, so I always felt a little a connection in that way. But also, I really liked the work she did. And on this land, she had some ritual where she really um, planted the energies of both the Buddha that she saw as mind and Jesus as the heart and kind of anchored those two energies there. So it's a really special place, really special land. And I really enjoyed the work that she did. And well, most time I enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> If you've done energy work, sometimes you don't enjoy it, but the benefits are wonderful. <laughs> and so I was, um, it's a little woo-woo, so just prepare yourself for that. If you're new, just hang on. We do get that way sometimes here. <laughs> and so I was sitting on her massage table, and she says, you know, it's, I, I'm seeing this, and she would sort of like guide me into the vision, or I would see the vision too, like we were kind of seeing and experiencing the same thing at the same time. But she would say, you know, I, I see this part of you like as a baby that just went, you know, checked out when you came in. Like, oh, no, no, I, no, I don't want to be incarnated again, no. You know, and it just sort of, and she said it's like hovering like over, way over like in the corner of the room. Like it's out of you. It's like part of your energetic being, but it's like, you know, a part of the soul that sort of gets, you know, I, I guess there was a part of me that just wanted to, you know, get back home, wherever home is. And, um, and, and so it was kind of disconnected. And so she, she said, you, do you want to bring that back in? I said, well, yeah. So, so I had this experience with her where she brought this piece of me back in. And I, it was like a love I've never felt before, just washed right through my being. And so it's like the tragedy of that, <laughs> the tragic part of that story is that I was trying to get out of the body, <laughs> right? <laughs> get out of this physical experience and back to the, you know, the love and the peace and the joy of, of that sort of disembodied idea that we have, that transcendent idea. And the truth was it's here. And, the, and the, the choice was to be here. When I was in ministerial school, the dean passed out these little slips to everybody on the first day. And it said, I choose to be here. She said, keep it with you. There will be times that you are going to rail against this, but remember that you chose to be here. <laughs> and it's kind of like that in life, right? We chose this. We chose to be here. And sometimes it's really hard. It's true. But there is an, a, a cycle of crucifixion and resurrection happening for us all the time. I loved that. It was so interesting in that song you just sang, Deborah, the the bridges, I guess that's what you call them. I'm not very musically inclined. But, the, the, um, but the, the times in between, like the song would shift, and it was almost like it was a new song. It was, it was, they were very distinct bridges. I think bridge is the right word. Tyler will correct me later. Modulations. modulations? OK, great. They're <laughs> modulations. I should have cleared this ahead of time. <laughs> 
But it was in the, it's in those pauses, you know, those sort of pregnant pauses of the shift. That's where the juice is. That's where the things are happening. It's, it's the crossing of the threshold, if you will, into the light. And then we're in that resurrection experience, but there's a whole thing that happens in the process. There's a willingness. There's a letting go. There's a surrendering, a giving over to spirit. So that's what this path is about, this mystical path that Jesus showed us of the resurrection, the Easter experience. It is a path of giving over to spirit while we're embodied. It's really a fascinating I mean, I, I'm like getting it at a whole different level now, and it's very exciting. I don't know if I can, you know, share that with you in a way that can land for you, but it's very exciting to, to get those, even when they're, they're small shifts, they're small modulations into, uh, but it's all part of the same song, you know, it's all part of the same lifetime. So we have these crucifixions and these resurrections, and, and by the way, don't forget the time in between. The time in the tomb is really important because it's that, it's that time of transition where things might feel a little dark and they might feel pretty empty, but remember the tomb is also a womb. It's not necessarily a place of coldness, but a place of warmth. It's not necessarily death, but it's rebirth. It's both. It's a death of the old and a rebirth of the new. And like Paul said, we die daily, really momently. We have these experiences. So all of us might have, you know, the time in our life where we could point and say, wow, that was my cross to bear. That was my crucifixion experience, right? That was the big one, the painful one, the one where I felt completely laid out and surrendered because I had no other choice. And then came along the teachings and the resurrection of, and I, and I brought myself back up in a whole new way with a new awakened state of being. So most of us, maybe at some point in our life, will have something like that. But most of the experiences will happen in little bits along the way, you know? But to, to say yes to the process, we chose to be here, yes, we're more than halfway there. We're embodied and we're on a spiritual journey. But Jesus always takes us deeper. He always takes us to the, the next level, says, no, come on, it's here, it's over here, come this way, this is the way I'm encouraging you to go. And what he calls that is the narrow gate. He says in the Sermon on the Mount, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and many will take it. But he says that the gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life, and few will find it. But we're there, you know? It's like we're on the cusp of it. We're, we're at the gate. We get it, right? You get that, don't you? You get that invitation that spirit gives you, the, the pull into the next and the next, the becomingness, the resurrection, and a key part of that, the letting go of, the crossing out what doesn't serve, the giving over what doesn't work for us anymore. And so there's that constant invitation and there is that sense that, that we are neither transcending the body nor abandoning the spirit. We are in the world, but not of it. That's what is meant by that. We are fully in it, fully embodied, all of us in it. Nothing's checking out. Nothing's trying to go somewhere. We're all here, fully present, alert, mindful to the experience. And yet we're not abandoning the fact that there is a deep presence here that wants to come through at all times. And so it is that uh, walk that is really the challenge of this work. And the Easter experience just sort of encapsulates the whole thing. That's why it's so potent this weekend. You know, and that's why it's so joyful on this day, because it is that, that experience that happens again and again and again in us. The death and the rebirth, the death and the rebirth, and that so important time in between. You know, that in-between time, we can't be doing pseudo-new beginnings, although we like to. Our culture doesn't like that transition time, isn't comfortable with the tomb, the darkness, the, the emptiness. But on a spiritual path, we know how important that is. That is a part of the mystical understanding. And so we allow it, even if we don't welcome it, we allow it, we accept it, we make friends with it, because we know what's coming, because we've been through it before. And we know the light will dawn again, and we know we will be brought into the light again, and the healing will happen again. And there will be a sense of restoration, and there will be a sense of harmony and joy. It's always there for us. It's always beckoning us 
But Jesus says, it might be the harder road, you know? It might be the, the, the it may not look as, that other road, it looks pretty open and it's pretty easy, but it's not going to take you anywhere, spiritually, fully. It's not going to allow you to be who you've come here to be. It's not going to allow you to bring the fullness of your gifts. It's not going to allow you to be like Moses was a couple weeks ago when we talked about, here I am. Just here I am. No agenda, no stuff that I'm dragging behind, you know? Not stuck on all the identity and the status and the titles and the... I mean, that's all part of what gets left behind when we go through the narrow gate. So what is it? What is that doorway for you or that gateway for you? What is it that you stand before? You know, you, you may not even realize. It might just be a sense of kind of a, a gentle nudge or, a, or maybe an urgent kind of calling that's, that's pulling you through to the next beingness, the next resurrection of the spirit in you as an embodied being. Anybody ever hear of Temple Grandin? So for those of you who don't know, Temple Grandin um, is a pretty well-known now a woman who was diagnosed with autism. She didn't actually speak until she was four, and then later she was diagnosed with autism. And her mother was this incredible advocate for her, long before we really knew much about autism. We still don't know a lot about it, but long before we really knew much of anything about it. And at that time, she also, her, her, as her mother really encouraged her to get in, get in education, she developed and she found that she really had a, a, a thing for science and really kind of almost a savant kind of ability to, to vision things. And um, so I, I won't go into her full story. You can watch her movie. But I want to show you this clip where she's talking with Dr. Carlock, her high school science teacher. And it's time for her to graduate. And this is a place where she's become very comfortable. This is a place where she's had some level of achievement, and she really you know, loves her mentor, Dr. Carlock, so she doesn't want to leave. Anybody ever get to that place? It's like, yeah, I finally got here. I've arrived. I've achieved. I'm comfortable. And then, and then God says, oh, no, no, go this way. And it's like, what? No, I don't want to go that way. It's like things are clicking. Everything's working here. I feel really confident and comfortable. And it's like there's that narrow gate pushing us through. There's that doorway that's opening. So in this clip, Temple is having a conversation with Dr. Carlock about really not wanting to leave. Let's see what he says. And that's exactly what happens. We walk right out into the light. And a lot of times, that's super scary, right? Where's the foothold? <laughs> Where's the next step? I can't see where I'm going. But that's the invitation. We don't know exactly where we're going. It's full on trust. And what happened for Temple is she trusted her teacher, right? Like we trust that inner teacher, that voice that is always there for us. And when we trust that, then we begin to kind of see it a little bit, like she had the vision of the doors. We get a little bit of a sense. We don't know exactly what will come through the door, but we get a little bit of a sense of the next step that there is a door to go through. And then there's a sense of faith that she sort of buoyed her faith. She even said an affirmation at the end, right? This is my door. And then she walks into her future self, the resurrection of her future self. So that's what it looks like for us. So whatever juxtaposition you're in in your life, wherever you are maybe pausing at some kind of doorway, whether you were conscious of it a moment ago or it just became conscious of it or haven't yet arrived at that understanding, it's not like you have to figure it out. It just will come. The door will come. The possibility will come. The invitation will come. And, and the urging is to, to go through, to walk through, to step through. Jesus says it in another way. Um, and there's, there's a way that, you know, in, in going through and in, in making this, this process, we get a little bit afraid that we're going to get stuck. Anybody ever get afraid that if you do go a certain direction, there's going to be some sticking? <laughs> I don't know about you, but the idea of like spelunking in a cave does not sound fun to me at all. The idea of getting stuck does not sound fun. And, but my niece, Natalie, um, she always enacted these kids' movies growing up. And, and she, one of her favorite scenes to enact was this one where Winnie the Pooh gets stuck. And she got such a kick out of this. And so, you know, you'd be walking in the living room, and there you'd see Natalie's little booties, you know, up in the air, stuck between the table and the couch. 
And she'd say, I'm stuck, I'm stuck, like Winnie the Pooh, and then she'd giggle, you know? Or she'd be out in the bushes against, between the rocks or between her bed and the wall. I mean, she would just do a lot of these enactments of the movies, but this was a particular one that I remember. And so this, she found joy, even, in being stuck. She thought it was funny to be stuck. And so I think of that. When I feel stuck, it's like I think of Natalie and how much joy she got out of being stuck. And it's like, lighten up. It's actually kind of funny, right? You're sort of stuck. You look funny, right? You know, if you saw, if you saw physically what's going on, right, you, it would look a little bit funny. And so if we can just find the humor and the lightness, I mean, it's not meant to be so serious, right? There is a, yes, there is sacred significance to the spiritual journey. But think of someone like the Dalai Lama. I mean, the Dalai Lama holds sort of the weight of the world, you know, spiritually. He holds that kind of space. Have you ever seen somebody more joyful? The guy giggles all the time. You know, so it's like if, if the, one of the great spiritual leaders of our time can hold that kind of spiritual space and significance and weight for the world and giggle all the time, then we can find that in us ourselves too. That's part of that lightness of the heart that we explored in the, in the meditation. So, so the part I was starting to tell you that Jesus... It takes, always takes it like another step further and another step further, right? So, so then he tells us this other story where the rich man comes and, and asks him, how do I get into the kingdom? And Jesus says, sell everything and follow me. And the guy goes, oh, yeah. <laughs> and see, uh, you know, walks the other way, right? And then Jesus turns to the people that are there, mostly the disciples, but other followers that are standing around, and he says this, very interesting, kind of a funny visual. He says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. Did you ever hear that? Isn't that a funny visual? I always have that in my mind, like the camel and the eye of the needle. Well, actually, it wasn't that literal. It wasn't that small of an opening. Historically and culturally at that time, there were these gateways to the cities. And so they were like archways. And so what would happen is the camel would come along, and the, usually the camels were packed full on their journey. And you had to unpack your camel to get it through the eye of the needle, the gateway to the city. And then you had to repack your camel. I mean, same idea, but not such a bizarre image, right? <laughs> And so the, then the, the invitation is, what do you need to unpack? You know, what, what camel, <laughs> what is your camel to unpack in order to enter, to enter into the city of this state, this sort of heavenly state, if you will, or the, the kingdom? What is it that you need to let go? And often it's sure stuff. You know, the, the story isn't about not having money. It's about attachment, right? It's about attachment to things. It's about attachment to money. But it's also deeper than that. It's about the attachments that we have to our identity. And that's the stuff that we, that the deeper place to work is how are we attached to different ways that we see ourselves or other people see, our, see us in the world? How are we attached to the things that we have achieved? How are we attached to the, if you wrote out a bunch of statements of I am and you wrote all the ways that you describe yourself, like as if you were doing your eulogy, right? And everybody would herald all the things and all the ways that you were in this lifetime. And if you then scratched all of those out and just came to the I am, that's it. It's no comparison, no better, no worse. You know, it's not about achievement. It's, it's really giving over our whole identity then we've arrived at a whole nother threshold. And that's really the big one that Jesus was showing us in the Easter experience, the complete annihilation of that persona, that idea of who we are, that ego that runs the show, and instead then moving into the purity of spirit, the consciousness of spirit, yet still embodied. David White is a poet that really helps us see the sense of of translucent holiness. That once we go through this place, we see the, the mundane world infused with the sacredness. We can be this kind of presence in the world. He says, you must note, and this is his poem, everything is waiting for you. You must note the way the soap dish enables you. 
or the window latch grants you freedom. Alertness is the hidden discipline of familiarity. The stairs are your mentor of things to come. The doors have always been there to frighten you and to invite you. And the tiny speaker in your phone, it is your dream ladder to divinity. The kettle is singing even as it pours you a drink. The cooking pots have seen the good in you at last. All the birds and creatures of the world are unutterably themselves. Everything is waiting for you. And everything is waiting for us. Everything is waiting for, everyone is waiting for us. Everyone is waiting for us to walk through the gate, even if it's narrow, to take the pathway that leads to life. Everyone is waiting for us to get that we have come here, yes, in a body to enjoy life absolutely and to be the very presence of spirit. That's the Easter experience that we've come for. That's the Easter experience that we live into every day. So whatever it is that you need to unpack, unpack your camel. Let it go. Is it forgiveness? Is it resentment? Is it some aspect that you're clinging to of your identity? Let it all go. Wow, how freeing, how liberating it is then to walk through and be in the light. Everything is waiting for you. What are you waiting for, if anything? Walk through. Resurrect. Be all that you can be. That's the gift we've come to be. That's the joy we celebrate on this day. Let's know this together as we speak an affirmation or two. Together, I am through the narrow gate. I am the resurrected, benevolent presence. And so it is.